Well, good morning and good afternoon to those of you uh, in Eastern time zone and Central time zone. Uh, the uh, my name is John Piggott. Uh, I am the managing director for uh, Innovacer for our payer and life sciences business sectors, and uh, I'll be the moderator of this webinar today. Webinar titled CMS Rural uh, Rural Trickle Down Effect. From unleashing interoperability to closing gaps in care. Our, I'm joined today by two panelists. Uh, first of all, um, President uh, and, and Healthcare Management and Transition Advisory Services and former EVP of CVS Health and Aetna is uh, Fran Soitzman. Welcome, Fran. Thanks, John. And uh, secondly, uh, Mike Sutton. Uh, Chief Technology Officer at Innovator and former CTO at Kaiser Permanente. Welcome, Mike. Yeah, thank you, JP. Great. So let me just review the agenda for today. We're gonna, we're really gonna explore um, several different uh, uh, trends and, and and effects of uh, data challenges and impact of COVID, uh, the evolution uh, of current uh, data collection strategies. Uh, we're gonna talk about. Uh, FIRE, the FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resource, and its, uh, it's an impact on uh, uh, our ability to do things like closing gaps in care in a new post-COVID um, kind of scenario. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, key points that health plans should uh, consider to begin preparing for a number of compliance deadlines that are coming up. And then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up with uh, our uh, Innovators Care is One infrastructure for payers and, and the healthcare data platform. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today, and uh, we'll spend the next hour or so uh, exploring these. First of all, as we go through this, uh, you know, that the, a healthcare um, data discussion isn't complete without the, um, w w without, you know, the, uh, the, the description of the you know the landscape and and the uh, fragmented data uh, world that we live in, uh, where data is really dispersed throughout the healthcare system. Uh, as a health provider, uh, you know you're in a, needing to integrate or access information on multiple different systems, whether it's in uh, in the uh, EHR or in the uh, acute care center or labs or or whether you're in a clinic uh, or even now with telehealth um, it's really scattered all over the place um, <clears throat> the uh, interesting uh, graphic here on uh, you know the, the the data problem um, you know we've got so much data uh, that is um, you know contextualized and resides in so many different systems first of all you know claims data, various different formats uh, for claims data that are out there, clinical data that resides in the EHR and, um, and uh, uh, you know, various different systems. Uh, and, and then uh, there's a whole new world of emerging data um, regarding telehealth, genomics, uh, lifestyle, uh, social determinants. Um, I wanna pause here on this chart and really just explore kind of the trends that are going on, the trends that we see. Uh, and uh, I guess I wanna start maybe, Fran, uh, with, uh, with your thoughts about how are health plans looking at this uh, you know, landscape of data and uh, data challenges and all this emerging data? What, what is your perspective? What's, what are health plans thinking about? Well, you've, you've teed it up nicely, JP. I mean, health plans have been wrestling with this for decades and um, the challenge has only gotten greater uh, because it's been kind of a piling on scenario, right? With, uh, you know, going uh, to ICD-10, but the government's been moving towards encounter data as being sort of the, um, uh, the, the, the source of truth. <laughs> so you still have to you still have to capture all this data, but what's going to be um, utilized, whether it's Medicaid or Medicare Advantage, is encounter data. Uh, so plans have a lot of redundancy. 
and redundancy costs a lot of money to support that kind of infrastructure um, because you have to capture certain data for quality reporting, other data for um, risk adjustment, uh, for example, and uh, that you know redundancy um, sort of feels like you know cross purposes, um, and we don't retire things, you know, we just add on, yeah. uh, and it, it, again, it becomes incredibly costly, um, and you know, when you have medical loss ratio limitations. Um, you know, you, it just puts your GNA under more and more pressure. Very so good. I, yeah, I'll sum it up that way. So yeah, I just like I just like to I, add I, to I your perspective here because uh, you're you're kind of the data guy uh, as as a CIO and CTO. Well, what's your perspective? Well, I just want to leverage that point Fran made about you know never retiring anything because you know if you look at this picture, it's kind of like. Well, is data here a plural or a singular? Well, in fact, there's an entire entire sphere that goes behind here because there are multiple, you know, in, you know, in my experience and in managing, you know, healthcare or or for that matter, any enterprise, but it, particularly in healthcare, there are so many um, applications that have to be um, stitched together in order to create any sort of coherent data thing, and so. So that could be, when you look at claims data or clinical data, that could be a hundred, or in some cases, even thousands of applications that are producing that data that needs to be integrated and abstracted. So um, it's good that we can put them in three categories, but it goes very deep in all the different formats and all the different versionings and all the different you know, archives and those types of things in order to get information around a patient requires that level of depth and not just the breadth that we're showing on this slide. It sort of parallels the universe, JP. <laughs> it's ever expanding, right? Yeah, yeah, there yeah. you go. Good analogy, friend. Good analogy. So so there's all this data that's floating around out there. And and, and you know the, the, the challenge is is really a data collection one. How do you how do you get a hold of all that data? How do you put it in in uh, in some sort of a a uh, logical or rational form uh, that you can do something with it. And uh, you know, looking at some of these statistics here, I was quite astonished actually to, uh, you know, when I see something like 75% of clinical data is in the unstructured form, I, I, I questioned the, the, uh, the definition of unstructured because I know I come from a background uh, uh, of, uh, of a lot of uh, EMR related uh, activities and rules and responsibilities. And I know we put tons and tons of data in structured form. That was what the EMRs were all about. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, Mike uh, or, or Fran, you know, what your thoughts are about some of these, um, some of these statistics here. I, I think I'll go, if you don't mind, Fran, I'll go first. But I think this is, speaks a little bit to that, that depth and the complexity in bringing these in. That 75% you know, it's not unstructured in the terms of computer science unstructured. Many of these are in record formats, but many of them are not. Many of them are PDFs, many of them are DICOM you know, or, or imaging. Um, a lot of the, lot of the um, you know, information that's coming in these new formats of, you know, like the digital dust and things that we're hearing, uh, learning from people come, you know, anecdotally and through texting and, and other types of unstructured data. But as well, there's a lot of unstructured data in those hundreds or thousands of applications that they're unstructured in the perspective that they don't follow, you know, for example, the FHIR format, which is a structured format. So they could be, you know, record level formats, but for, for an aggregation, for data aggregation, um, they require that to be rectified and put into a common format and structured. And the other one I'll just add on there, just another our, a statistic that we're seeing in, in a lot of our clients, when they say on average a, a patient or a member has 80 pages of records, that roughly relates to about 800 rows in a database. And, and when you start looking at these, these are coming again from those multiple sources, 
is being able, and they're identified differently in those 800 records, as many as 10, 15 different ways of identification. That also has to be, um, be um, minimized and you know all the duplications removed for that. So you know it just it kind of goes back to that expanding universe that Fran mentioned that it just keeps expanding. Yeah, yeah. So um, the uh, you know what <clears throat> some of the examples that uh, in terms of unstructured data that I'm familiar with, uh, you know, are you know uh, physician uh, notes, for example, that uh, are are appended to an electronic medical record, but they're handwritten uh, uh, or in text that that's not structured. Another another example might be um, that uh, there might be a, 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 a page that is a, a surgical, a pre-surgical ops uh, checklist of all the things that you need to do to ensure that, uh, you know, that your, your patient is, is uh, properly prepped for surgery. And that checklist, once it's completed, gets inserted into the medical record too. And it, so you, you, now you have a, a checklist document and how do you, how do you codify that? Um, <clears throat> Fran, do you want to comment maybe on, on, on just the, you know, the, the size, the hundred million medical record reviews that are conducted each year? Um, enormous amount of, uh, of records, enormous amount of work uh, for people to, to do, which is a huge cost to the healthcare system. Well, it's, it's a huge cost, and it's also, uh, I would say, a source of, of friction um, between payers and providers. I mean, it can be inc incredibly disruptive uh, if not done, you know, appropriately and properly. Um, to the extent that this can be done electronically, um, you know, <clears throat> much more efficient and 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 not disruptive. But to the extent that it's still relying on paper files, uh, it's disruptive because <clears throat> you've got multiple payers coming into a physician's office, you know, throughout the year. But it's necessary because you know you're you're doing it for you know, gathering information for HEDIS, for 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 stars, for caps, for um, uh, all different type, for maybe some you know claims audits. Uh, medical record reviews, you know, there are many different reasons why those charts need to be reviewed. Um, so it, it's incredibly, you know, disruptive. So it's not just a risk adjustment, as people oftentimes think of. It's, you know, for quality, it's for regulatory reasons. Um, so to the extent that this can be done electronically, um, you know, 100% of the time, it's going to, I think, take out a lot of contention um, between providers and and the in, in the uh, payer industry. Yeah, I think that uh, you know, getting it done a hundred percent of the time is a lofty goal. There's always going to be some, you know, kind of on the fringes stuff that are quite unique and different. But I know in a in a prior life for me, we you know, at uh, at All Scripts, I ran the payer and life sciences business there for six years. And we really focused one of our key um, solutions that we developed and brought to the market was, you know, a clinical data exchange application where a health plan could come to us and say, I want uh, my member, Joe Smith, I want every encounter from, uh, you know, January through June of 2020. And we would go fetch that record and, and uh, authenticate it and, and deliver it um, in usually about a 24 hour period. Uh, <clears throat> and we started. <clears throat> with uh, you know HL7 format and CCD format and then migrated to CCDA and you know fire now helps us get a little bit more standardized on how we can do that and I think also will expand the uh, you know the, the amount of, of uh, information that we can deliver electronically um, so uh, be, we're, we keep chipping away at that number uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure where it is today in terms of percent to, to, uh, to total, but if we could get it to, to a point where, you know, 80% of the volume is delivered uh, electronically, we'd be doing uh, fantastic. Um, and uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. We'll, 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 we'll progress a little bit um, here. Uh, <clears throat> so lots of data challenges, uh, you know, lots of data collection challenges. And uh, 
And now we have COVID-19 you know, that we're battling, uh, which has created a number of other challenges, you know, around how do you do this uh, and, 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 you know, with a population that's now dispersed and, and all over the place is not coming in to see the doctor necessarily. So, uh, you know, COVID's driving uh, even a new need for interoperability because of, uh, you know, people are not um, showing up in the, in the practice every day. Um, there's, you know, there's a lo lots of uh, trends towards uh, telehealth services and how can you do a nice job of, of uh, cl closing either quality or coding gaps when you, you're not sitting in front of the patient. Um, I guess, Fran, what, what are your thoughts on, on this and, uh, you know, and the, and the disruptive nature of COVID and how the health plans in the U.S. are, um, are migrating to address that? You know, it, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Um, on one hand, um, you know, I applaud CMS for accelerating um, the expansion of telemedicine, telehealth uh, services. It, it, it ordinarily, you know, it, it would have been a multi-year, you know, kind of crawl, walk, run phase in of, of telemedicine. So the pandemic and the fact that physician offices were shutting down all over the country and uh, people needed an alternative uh, approach to accessing medical services and telemedicine was was the vehicle and and CMS and HHS stepped up that's the good news the the not so good news is exactly what you just touched on and that is it has limitations um, you can only do so much by phone or by video um, and uh, you know ultimately either of those services get postponed um, unless they are you know clearly a medical emergency in which case you know, the patient's going to go into the ER um, but the gaps in care uh, I think are going to result in setbacks in, in terms of you know some of the important gains that have been made by the industry um, by you know that partnership between providers and and the industry um to you know to to improve the quality of life of the patient population because you know working together um you can see it in the star scores you can you know you know across all the medicare advantage plans you can see it in, in the medicaid populations um the plans getting on board again can only happen if you if you got the provider community that that's embracing it, working together to improve um, the quality outcomes. And it's at that point of care, you're getting them the data. Well, with telemedicine, you know, again, the limitations. So I think it, it's temporary. Um, you know, we're going to get through this pandemic at some point. Um, you know, in the next nine to twelve months. Um, but it, it's a real issue right now, um, and it's a trade-off. That's how I look at it. Yeah, and I think uh, I think uh, in, in this short period uh, that we we really jumped into the deep end of the pool with telehealth, I think consumers of healthcare, patients, have gotten used to the fact that that's such a convenient way to do things. You know, you didn't, now you don't necessarily have for 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 an uh, annual well visit, you don't necessarily have to take an entire day off <laughs> to plan your day, schedule your day, uh, go go to the doctor's office, sit for a long time because you're waiting in line, and then um, you know do a do a largely something that could be done via the phone. Um, so I think, but that's also a watch out. That's a watch out in terms of the trade off of the convenience. And um, what may not have, you know, that lost opportunity in the office, um, you know, service that could have been rendered in the mm -hmm. office, there is that gap. Um, so I, I think it, it comes down to, you know, physician judgment, uh, whether he or she thinks that telemedicine post-pandemic is the right venue for that patient's annual physical. Right, right. What, um, you know, I'm just curious, this is, this is a little bit off topic, but I'm just curious, Fran, what your thoughts are on what 
what kind of um, of quality gaps do we think can be closed via a telehealth visit, and what kind can't? Somebody that needs to actually get their hands on on, on their patient and do do a check-in, because it seems to me there could be a number of them that that do, as long as the physician has the right information in front of them on their patient while they're talking to them. Well, I, I would I would imagine you know there would be those that lend themselves just to, um, you know the, the the visual inspection, if you will. You know, um, anything that requires, you know, probing, that ain't gonna <laughs> that's not gonna happen. Yeah. Um, you know, so I. I, I think it's going to be fairly limited, and I obviously I'm not a clinician, uh, so I, I I think I'm probably, you know, in the ballpark here. It's 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 probably a relatively low percentage of services that would fall into that category. Yeah, but I mean, there's a, there are a number of routine things as well. You know, a diabetic that needs to get an A1C test, and you know, if the, if the doctor can be presented with their information while they're talking, then they can get that ordered and the person can go get the, get the appropriate tests, et cetera. So I think there'll be the some things. Absolutely. Education. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Any event. Okay. Well, I just, it's, that was a bit of a tangent, but, um, but, uh, I mean, interesting compliment it. Let me just caveat one, one other point, uh, JP <laughs> supplement it with, um, with technology, you know, in other words, if there's a scale, um, you, you know, that uh, blood that pressure monitor, pressure monitor, yeah, so those kind of there, there, it, it, there are some things that that could be introduced, provided it's supported with technology. So telemedicine alone, that's that's where we have to go to telehealth and introduce other pieces of technology. That would supplement the uh, the examination. Yeah, and that and, and frankly, you know, there, there's that's that addresses all those sort of emerging unstructured data elements and and how Fire can really help uh, with at least creating a more standard platform, a standardized approach to ingesting that kind of information. So, so I think we're getting we're getting close. You know, we're, we're not going to solve this uh, overnight, but um, I think technology, to your point, Fran, is going to help. So I think we're at a point right now when uh, where I want to pull up a, a poll and engage our audience um, on uh, just a quick question. Um, you know, and and so the poll for the audience are. Uh, where do you encounter the greatest challenges due to poor data quality? Um, and we're going to open the poll and give you uh, a few minutes to to um, answer the question. But uh, you know the, the the choices are uh, quality measure reporting, things that we were just talking about, um, clinical decision support, uh, being able to create a pathway of some sort and present it uh, for a uh, a particular a disease state, uh, care and disease management programs, you know, population health related, or revenue cycle management, building and coding uh, issues. So, um, the uh, Fran, if you were to, uh, to take a look at this, what would what would you say would be one of the or some of the biggest challenges on this list? Oh, I would have to say. Um... Quality, quality measure reporting, and um, care and disease management programs. Yeah. Okay. One and three. Mike, uh, you know, as a as a CTO uh, and CIO, you've been in the middle of the you know sort of the data crunch with this kind of thing. What do you see from a technical side of the picture in terms of supporting these kinds of challenges yeah it's it's funny i laugh because um it's like every single one of those analytic groups you know that i work with all feel there's those problems and um you know we've probably had equal pr pressure from every single one of those disciplines you put up there so you know from a from a infrastructure 
perspective, a technology perspective, I think they are all feeling the same kind of pain of, you know, finding access to the, the data, the time it takes to get data to them. And then directly where this question is going is, is the quality, you know, many times of the analysts that are doing this reporting, you know, they'll say they have to spend 70 to 80% of their time actually verifying the veracity of the data because it was given to them in, you know, mixed formats or, 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 or with miss, missing, you know, fields. And so, but I got it equally from all four of those groups that you, you have there they, because it's the same infrastructure. And so it, it just yeah. never met the, 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 what they were looking for in every case. Right, right. Okay, well, thanks for that, Mike. Um, well, I, I, uh, I'll look to our, uh, our organizers on, on the poll. Perhaps we've given enough time for the poll. Can we show the results? <laughs> I, I hope I didn't influence the voting. <laughs> Yeah, Fran, who's who's going to win the election? <laughs> <laughs> so I have, yeah, there we go, seventy nine percent quality measure. So, so well, Fran, you're so well respected in the industry. Everybody just went, oh, if he says so. <laughs> uh, yeah, but there there's a fair amount for care and disease management as well. So interesting. Uh, all right. Well, uh, you, you you certainly called it. That's for sure, Fran. Um, very good. Any uh, any other thoughts or observations now that we've seen the results? Nope. Okay. Let's uh, let's continue on. Then. Um, we'll go to. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna transition a little bit to you know kind of a view from the uh, physicians practice side and you know they the this data here was astonishing to me uh that physician practices have spent more than 15.4 billion dollars and on average per practice 785 hours a year dealing with quality reporting the uh it's enormous amount of money um as we said earlier you know when you're when you're reviewing uh, or involved in 100 million records a year that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of time and energy uh to just to, to put on that any any thoughts or observations before we um kind of dive into this we'll just keep going then so <clears throat> so this really addresses you know that we're talking about the, the you know the 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 data um the data collection piece and and uh you know the 100 million records that are reviewed a year uh and really the evolution of that data collection um strategy uh it, it started way before this chart uh, you know i think kind of from my perspective i uh, uh i saw back prior to say 2015 you know that this was old school this was uh, health plans would, I used to call parachute people into the practice and uh, they would spend uh, days, um, you know, scanning and copying records and then uh, put them in their folder and hand carry them back to the health plan. And then they give them to the data collection team, uh, data entry team to hand enter all those uh, records back into the system, which was A, very expensive, B, fraught with errors. Um, we have um, migrated, uh, you know, and made positive strides, and we've gone through, you know, a number of different um, evolutions, I'll call it, or steps. Uh, from 2015 to 17, you know, we got, we started getting into the electronic uh, exchange, uh, but we didn't have very good forms and formats. We had to deal with lots of messiness with the data. Um, as we moved, as we progressed into like 17 and 18, we began to get much more structured with HL7 and CCDA formats, uh, <clears throat> which were good, but didn't include everything that we needed. Uh, and now, you know, uh, from 2018 to today, you know, we're, we're getting it, we're making progress and moving into the future with a fire standard and the ability to pull data real time 
with complete industry standards and, and uh, much quicker implementations. Um, so with that as a backdrop, any, any observations, uh, challenges that you see, Fran, that, that, that the health plans have been faced with and how did they overcome those? Well, I, I think you know we're, we're clearly going in the right direction. That's you know that's the obvious, and and um, it's been painful to get there, but but uh, uh, you know thankfully we're in a much better place now than we've ever been. Um, real time, you know, the ability to to get more data real time is 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 critical. It's a very dynamic business. Um, you know things happen fast um you have to have you know you have to have the data timely everything is um uh, measured you know there's metrics for everything whether it's based on a customer requirement or a regulatory requirement uh you, you know you got you got to have the data oftentimes to to meet those those requirements so um and, and I, the other the other thing I would say is that you know we're shifting more of our focus on the payer side from claims um, to uh, social determinants. So that's really getting out in front of it. So that's you know that's a different kind of data, right? And it's really understanding environments and um what what's happening in in communities uh that is creating challenges in people's health downstream and you know what do we need to do to affect that uh so it's, it's a whole different you know campaign if you will um that that the industry is, is going after working with public health officials and 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 providers and and obviously the communities to bring about better outcomes that's you know that's not an overnight solution but it's long overdue that it's getting the attention that that it so desperately needs so that's you know something that heretofore was not happening i mean 10 years ago nobody was talking about social determinants and now it's something that everyone is not just talking about it but they're doing something about it yeah yeah very very pertinent the uh mike you've been through all the the bloody uh years of 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 all these uh stages of evolution um you know we're kind of now the current state of of data exchange is kind of represented on this chart here with all the multiple different systems on the left um all the various different um uh you know sort of as a cio all your clients you know the business resources that use all this data multiple different data formats multiple different uh data exchange gateways that are connecting to a whole plethora of of uh exterior applications um what are your observations as as a technology guy in terms of this evolution and how did you manage through it and where are we today and then I think in a future chart, we're going to talk about the impact of fire on this picture, but interested in your observations. So I think one op one observation, you know, and having only been in healthcare seven years, you know, much less than the two of you, um, you know, I think the future is bright for healthcare because the the bad news is we're behind where a lot of the other industries are. That 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 uh, that evolution from you know sending bulk files and ASCII files that required work on both ends and and then you hardly ever got the data right and it was an incredibly inefficient mechanism to this the point of where you know the records are now formatted it's an EDI type format necessitated an intermediary well I was in the oil and gas business we had the same thing there as in the travel industry they had that there as well and you know all those industries now including financial you know, have all adopted these APIs. And so I think there's a real pattern that the healthcare industry can take from all these people, all these industries that have gone before us. And, you know, and like Fran mentioned, I mean, I just, you know, my hat's off to the, you know, to the CMS of getting those fire specs right, because that is what's required. It doesn't have to be 100% right to get started, but let's at least get 
a common language to do these exchanges. And then I think what we'll see, just like we've seen in these other industries, is we're going to see a lot of efficiencies coming in, at least you know, in the bowels of the basement where the IT guys are, the, the amount of effort required to move the data between people who need it and the synchronization of the data I, are going to provide real efficiencies for the healthcare space. I mean, to me, um, you know, like structural type type changes because of the, the utter inefficiencies we kind of had, again, with the thousands of systems and and hundreds, if not thousands, of data transfers every every night. Yes. Okay. So so let's move forward then. Um, you know, and and we talk about the 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 uh, fire in the context of this interoperability rule, and it really presents us with an opportunity to really drastically reduce some of these data collection costs and processes that we've discussed. Um, by enhancing, you know, the breadth of information uh, and the ability to share with partners. You know, it's a modern standard. Flex, it a lot, uh, offers flexible pay payloads. It's a universal adapter. Um, all kinds of good things. I call it motherhood and apple pie from a, from a technology standpoint. So this is really, Mike, I'm interested in your comments on this one. This is really how you know, the industry is looking at a, a fire-enabled data platform for payers now. And and uh, again, very similar chart to what we saw as a current state, but now with uh, fire technology laid in here, um, can you comment on, you know, kind of what you're seeing on this chart and, uh, and some of the some of the key differentiations between fire and the old way and the benefits that we'll see? Yeah, so this is kind of, you know, we said, you know, we we talked about how glorious the APIs are going to be and all this. Now this is kind of some of the work that needs to get done to do this. And, you know, because as we know, you know, the the EMR systems out there today, you know, a lot of those don't have those APIs. You mentioned CCDs. I mean, we're still getting a lot of files and information in that format. And so I think there's a lot of um in, and when you put together a healthcare data platform to get to that right-hand side, which you know we described as a nirvana, is there's a lot of work that's required to get that data prepared and ready to be put in those APIs. You, there's um, you know there's the pieces of we have to ensure quality because now that the APIs are out there, we talked about transparency they provide. Well, it's also going to show transparency with bad data, and so there's going to be some regimen required. That maybe in the past we kind of um, you know didn't have to worry about as much, but a regimen around the quality and the speed and the access of that information. So there's going to be some work in that data integration and 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 standardization column that we have there. And then and then secondly too, and and I know for sure that ONC is working on this and some of the definition is. You know, the nice thing about APIs is they're transparent. Well, the bad news is they're transparent. And so we need to make sure that when we send information to people, we're certain of their identity. Um, we're certain that we have permission as because during the whole discussion on this, you know, privacy is not, you know, is non-negotiable. The security and privacy of this data is as important as ever. Fortunately, APIs have a very good security control mechanism, but we do have to make sure that we follow the right authentication and identification. And then, and then preparing now for, for APIs is some of a, somewhat of a different infrastructure. Before, when we sent files, all you needed was a file server and FTP server. Well, now you need an API gateway. We need to be able to get consent for people. And then we've got the place where we start producing these APIs. And this is pretty much consistent with you know, other, you know, what people are providing, what payers are building out today is, you know, from, our, from our purview. Very good, thanks for that. So we talked earlier about you know, FIRE's uh, ability to help uh, you know, drive quality uh, and gap closure. So you know, this really represents a few opportunities uh, to use FHIR to drive uh, HEDIS reporting efficiencies, both from a provider engagement and gap sharing perspective, um, to uh, the ability to influence gap closure by presenting opportunities right at the point of care, um, and then supplemental data collection. Again, you know, when you need additional data to be able to do all that as much 
as possible electronically uh, and, uh, and, and be collecting, you know, the most current up-to-date data you can uh, with, you know, a 24-hour or less turnaround time. Today, we're talking days or weeks. Um, and, then, and then collaboration, uh, you know, between, um, uh, you know, member level uh, uh, rules and, and internal various uh, cross-functional uh, stakeholders. So, uh, Fran, uh, interested in, in, as you see this, uh, these these specific focuses on efficiency, you know, are, are, are you seeing the same level of focus in, within the health plans on, on using this kind of technology to provide them leverage and efficiencies? Well, I think it's going to be, I think the, the plans will rally around it because I think what it ultimately will do will give them uh, the ability to measure progress more efficiently, more timely, so that they can take action, devote more time to affecting the outcomes, right? Because you have a limited time, right? The timeline is non-negotiable, the measurement period. That's prescribed by the government. And um, so to the extent that you can um, have a, a more reliable um, measurement period because you've got a you've got a, 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 a finer instrument to do the measurement with that gives you you know reliable feedback um, uh, you're going to have more time to then affect it right to, to do the implement to do to do the 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 outreaches to your beneficiaries to affect the ultimate outcome Within yeah, that. you know, that is a great observation, Fran, uh, and one I hadn't thought of until now, and that is, um, it, 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 you know, if you looked at the workload as being 100%, perhaps, you know, up until now, uh, health plans are, 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 are taking 75% uh, of that workload is just getting their hands on the data to create the evidence or insights, and then they have such little amount of time to actually do it. <laughs> do the work now we can make this process much more efficient and they can spend 80 percent of their time solving the problem and 20 percent of their time gathering the data to create the insights that's right yeah very good observation um okay so um so that leads us to you know what do we think payers need to do here um as they move forward to uh, get prepared to take advantage of this kind of technology to create that leverage that we were just talking about. You know, we, we, they need to set up an IT infrastructure for API enablement, as Mike was talking about earlier on the prior chart. Um, they need to implement and maintain secure on-demand information exchange uh, based on standards. Um, they need to enable this seamless data exchange uh, they need to aggregate and standardize data, you know, especially claims and clinical data at the member level. Uh, participate in trusted exchange networks. Those will come out uh, and enable easy member health data access. That's actually part of that CMS interoperability rule, um, patient access. Uh, so, so that's just a quick, uh, you know, list. Any any thoughts or comments on that? Mike, this is pretty much technology related. Yeah, and those, you know, just from a, a, a general, um, you know, kind of data effectiveness or the data network effect, if you'd like to call it that, is, you know, those last two points on, you know, working in exchanges and networks. And, you know, it's, you know, I'll go back to my experience in the travel industry. You know, I worked for the cruise lines and it would be great that we had an API, but if, if the hotels, the air travel, the um, the car rental agencies, if they didn't participate in the network at all, there never would have been that plus up with the actual customer. I apologize for that noise if you hear it. But, but so I think it's the same thing in the healthcare space is as we go forward, I think there's going to be a, a, a lot of kind of, um, you know, kind of business decisions that need to get made. And if we truly, you know, are going to put the patient and the member at the center of all this, I think being able to trust people in that network 
to be able to share that information because we all have the common way of protecting it. I think it'll be really important to truly, truly enable, you know, um, you know, total advantage for for the members. Just like you know, like you know, all the the you know the consumer uh, consumer industries have done. It's very similar to me in healthcare, which is going to be very important. JP, yep. I, I wanted to just, you know, we talked about this earlier uh, today, but the, I, I see, you know, this 1200 page document, final rules. I, I, I think the payer to payer um, data exchange is one of the real positives that, that came out of this. I think this is going to, um, I don't see any downside. I, I think it's all positive. Um, it, it's going to solve some of the, you know, the pain points for providers, for beneficiaries, patient members, um, and and for payers, frankly, um, by, you know, sharing data um, from, uh, you know, members that, uh, that were one payers for a couple of years and now have transitioned to another payer. Um, it just makes good sense. It just makes good common sense to, you know, every, every, every payer is saying that they're a member centric company, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but their actions don't necessarily reflect that. And as an yeah. industry, we should be in lockstep uh, with, with that. And this is a great way to, to support that. Very good. Well, so we've talked about, uh, you know, the data collection challenges, uh, some of the new standards that are coming out to help us with that and healthcare data platform to um, to actually run and manage it on uh, and really run from uh, these current challenges of multiple electronic trans, uh, uh, transaction standards, lack of, of singular standardization data formats, incompatible systems, lack of care coordination, uh, no single patient identifier, two, a compliant and interoperable um, payer workflow uh, around a compliance with regulatory requirements, direct EMR integration, uh, cross-system connectivity, uh, unified patient records. You know, I put all this in the motherhood and apple pie uh, category. Uh, it all sounds great, but there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, technology and workflows and uh, data management capabilities that go behind that in order to make that happen. Um, so uh, with that, I want to uh, transition into uh, our second poll of the day, uh, which is, and this time, Fran, we, we'll, we'll, we'll pr try not to predict and affect everybody's vote. But um, so the question is, how do you classify your understanding and readiness to implement fire for quality programs. Um, a, not aware of NCQA plans and relevance of fire for HEDIS, somewhat aware. Uh, you got a documented strategy and approach to leverage fire for quality use cases, or you've uh, even gotten to the point where you're executing pilots around fire for HEDIS and STAR measure improvement. We'll give that uh, uh, a couple of minutes to uh, to um, to bake a little bit and and let give people an opportunity to enter their their uh, poll input. Um, Mike, any any uh, any comments with respect to you know just sort of the overall trends, uh, you know uh, uh, the the evolution to fire standards the evolution to healthcare data platform to manage that uh, and, and, and where we're headed. Any other um, sort of summarizing comments about that? Well, I, I just, uh, you know, I was, uh, I took Fran's comment to heart about the regulation being 1200 pages. I actually didn't know that, but, but even with 1200 pages, um, there's a lot of room for interpretation in you know, not so much the APIs. I think the structured way that we share data is fairly well defined, um, which is really required because you can't, again, you can't, if you're gonna do these seamless exchanges, you need to make sure you understand what that data is. But some of the areas of, you know, what is, you know, what is the interpretation and enforcement of data blocking? What is, 
what level of consent and at what level of detail is consent required. There's issues of delegation, um, you know, and then, you know, past years, you know, people change plans over, you know, over their lifetime. Um, what are the responsibilities of the legacy plans, you know, going back to 2016 to get that data in? And so, um, you know, I, I see there's still room for interpretation of a lot of these things. And, you know, as we have customers that we're onboarding with this, we're finding, you know, that different organizations are interpret them slightly different. And so one of the challenges we have as a provider in this space is how do we stay configurable for, um, for each person's particular use case and how they want to manage um, those things like, you know, consent as an example. Yeah, very good. Okay, so uh, to our organizers, do we have enough uh, results in to publish the poll? And uh, Mike, you know, I can't see it. So um, Mike or, or Fran, uh, uh, if you can see it, maybe just read it off because they haven't sure. put it in. I, I can see it. Um, the first item not aware of NCQA plans and relevance uh, of fire and he for HEDIS is, is the number one vote voted at 36%. Somewhat aware of NCQA digital measure plans and fire use cases, number two at 29%. Documented strategy to leverage fire for quality use cases is number three at 21 percent, uh, and executed pilots around fire for heat of star measures came in at number four at 14 percent. Okay, so so generally speaking, people are are at, kind of at the starting line. You know, I, I either um, either uh, just getting started or just being made aware. Any uh, any. Uh, any thoughts or reactions to that, to those results? I think that's pretty consistent. What we're we're seeing, JP, is you know the you know date the dates are looming, but a lot of folks are kind of getting fired up. It takes a while to get you know in the in the bigger plans, get get the uh, you know get the project set up, get the team going, and like we've mentioned probably many many times, is accumulating that data to solve the needs of the requirements of that spec. Um, is not an insignificant task. So I, I, I can see people are still kind of planning and you know getting started in this space. Well, in my observation, Mike and, and Fran, is that it, it, this isn't surprising at all because uh, most of the people that I'm talking to at health plans around uh, implementing this interoperability regulation are focused on implementing the <laughs> interoperability regulation. This is yeah. kind of the next step in the uh, uh, you know the the next shoe to drop is now that we've implemented this technology, what can we do to use it for other purposes that you know leverage it outside of just the uh, uh, you know that those four um, uh, specific CMS um, rules and and so this is really saying how do I leverage it to for HEDIS data collection? How do I leverage it? for um, you know, a star and he just measure reporting, that sort of thing. So it's not completely surprising that, that, that the, all the resources right now are getting teed up to implement the regulation and the, kind of my pr perspective, the next step is soon to be taking these kinds of steps. You know, JP, I think it's important to, to, to kind of come back to what the guiding principles of, um, of of this entire initiative, you know, is is all sort of predicated on, and and I'm I'm going to paraphrase it, but you know, if, if I look at the the legal language of of this final rule, what you know, what was behind it, it, it was always HHS's intention that that this final rule was intended to move healthcare the healthcare ecosystem in in the direction of interoperability. Uh, to signal the commitment to a vision set uh, out into the 21st Century Cures Act to improve the quality and accessibility of information um, for Americans uh, to, to be able to make informed healthcare decisions, including the data about healthcare prices and outcomes, while minimizing reporting burdens on affected healthcare providers and payers, number one, and then number two, um, the second rule was uh, is that 
is that CMS interoperability and patient access final rule, the heart of the rule is the, is the patient first mindset, um, s supporting the previous rule by giving patients access to their health information when they need it most and in a way they can use it. So, you know, we kind of get lost in all of the, the, the technical part of it. I think it's important to bring it back to, you know, what, 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 what motivates all of this in the first place? <laughs> Yeah, very, very, very true statement. And it, always keep that end prize in mind because there's lots of uh, messiness along the way to get there. Um, I want to just switch and, and as we wrap up, we have just a few minutes left um, and, and talk a little bit about Innovacer's Care as One infrastructure for payers and then turn it over to Mike Sutton to talk a little bit further about uh, Innovacer's um, uh, really platform for the CMS regulatory uh, uh, interoperability rules. So fundamentally, Innovacer is a, um, uh, a uh, data uh, platform, data management platform that, uh, you know, in our DNA, we interface with and uh, ingest data from all these th those disparate systems that we talked about in the healthcare ecosystem, in the community. We put it through our data activation platform, many different levels of, of transformation into a unified data model and create a unified patient record in the community. Uh, and then on top of that, um, fundamental uh, building block uh, uh, architecture are a number of different line of business applications, provider engagement applications where we are embedded in the workflow of an EMR. We've integrated with almost every single EMR in the market. We have a care management workflows and utilization management workflows. We have an entire suite of member engagement um, uh, uh, contact modalities and, and tightly integrated with our care management system. We've got uh, interactive uh, uh, dashboards and analytics that all uh, that all you know take all that data and uh, illuminate create insights for it and then specifically the the interoperability and regulatory APIs that uh, that help are specifically targeted at this CMS solution. So at a high level, this is what Innovate does for payers in the industry. And then I'll ask Mike to just comment briefly about our uh, healthcare data platform and how it's playing into the regulation. Mike? Well, on the briefly part, you know, of course, is my challenge, JP. But I mean, fortunately for us, and you showed in API on, on the last slide, is that the, our platform has been built, as we mentioned, API has been, been around for quite a while. So the two good things is our entire infrastructure and application lifecycle is built on a set of APIs. And the other fortunate part is that FireSpec has been out for nearly four years. So there were a lot of drafts. So we were building those out while it was still in draft, and fortunately, it was implemented, um, you know, recently as it was regulated. But, but if you take a look at this, this is kind of the basic pieces needed. We, we mentioned many parts of this um, to to satisfy the CMS requirement in our understanding with the connectivity pieces, you know, creating the APIs, and also making sure that your data is of high quality and that you see member authentication on there that we're 100% certain that, that you're giving the data to the right people. And then of course, now the new things that come out in the regulation is the, the, the working with and providing data to third party apps and then member consent. And I'll, I'll stop there, but this is the basic framework for a solution to, to satisfy that requirement and what we are what we're, um, producing at, at Innovation. Well, thanks for that, Mike. And I, I think we're pretty much at time now. Um, so I'm not sure we really have uh, a, any time left for, for questions, but any questions that were submitted, we will certainly follow up and, and provide answers to those, those folks that submitted them. Uh, I just want to take the last few seconds of our time and, to thank uh, my panelists, Mike Sutton and Fran Soitzman. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. And uh, uh, look forward to uh, continuing our journey here. That's it for the day. Appreciate your participation of the audience. Thanks, JP. Thanks, Thanks Ryan. Thanks, Mike.